is called Calvary, and that person is called Jesus. Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. The hardest two services and the hardest two sermons in a revival are the first one and the last one. And so uh, I have shared with you some things this week that I hope have been a blessing and an encouragement to your heart. But uh, I think this is the message the Lord would have us to close the revival on. It's a very simple message. Most of my sermons are. You know, I've never been, it's never been a compliment to me when somebody says, boy, you're a deep preacher. All that means is they didn't understand one thing I said. And so I've never tried to be a deep preacher. I've tried to be a preacher that makes God's Word understandable. And I believe every person that's in the house has been able to understand what I've said in the messages this week. Well, this is a very simple message tonight, but it has a lot of real good truth in it. And I hope you'll listen. There just may be somebody here tonight who needs to be saved. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Mark 3, 20. If you found it, say amen. amen. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Now I want to tell you, when the house has got so many folks in it, you can't eat bread, somebody ought to go home. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that's just too many folks in the house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. And the scribes, which came down from Jerusalem, said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. The life that you live is determined by the way you have answered questions in the past. There are a lot of questions that may come in life that are not very important. They're really not big deals at all. Like where are we going to have supper? That's not a big deal. You can, you can go, I tell you, nobody ought to starve to death in this part of the world. Y'all got so many restaurants here. But that's not a big important question. What, what am I going to wear tonight? That's really not that big a deal. But there are some questions in life that are very important. Like, like who are you going to marry? That's, a, that's an important question. And if you don't answer that right, you're going to have some misery down the way. Or where am I going to go to school? That's an important question. What vocation am I going to go into? That's an important question. What, where am I going to live? Am I going to live in the community where I've grown up or am I going to move off and, and plant and bloom somewhere else in another part of the nation? And so those are very important questions and, and most of us have to face those questions somewhere in our life. But the two most important questions in life, I believe the very two most important questions are these. Number one, who is Jesus? And number two, what are you going to do with him? Who is Jesus and what are you going to do with him? Now, you cannot answer the second question until you deal with with the first question. You can't make a decision on what to do with him until you first of all come to grips with who is he? Who is Jesus? These verses that I've read for you tonight give to us three different pictures of who Jesus is. And I have to be honest with you, 
I don't think there are any other options. After I share with you these three pictures of who some believe Jesus to be, when you look at these three, I think that exhausts the list. I don't think there are any other options available. So let's look at what these different folks said about who Jesus was. First of all, there are some who believe that Jesus is deranged. Look what it says there in verse 21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. Now the reason that house was so full that day was because Jesus was in the house. And Jesus always, everywhere he went, he attracted huge, huge crowds. And so the house was full. People were standing all around outside the house because Jesus was in the house. Well, the Bible says when his friends heard where he was. Now, these were his friends. When his friends heard that he was there in that house, they went to lay hold on him. That meant they went to seize him. They went to bodily take charge of him and move him, remove him from the house because they had come to the conclusion he is beside himself. Now what does that mean, beside yourself? Well, it means you stand right here and your mind is over there. That means you have lost your mind. Now these were his friends. Now, folks, I want to tell you, when your friends think you're crazy, you don't need a lot of enemies. But the Bible says these were his friends. Now, I want to ask you tonight, or if I were to ask you tonight, how many of you believe that Jesus had lost his mind? I don't think a single person here would raise their hand. I know, you know, Jesus had not lost his mind. But his friends, they had seen some of the things he'd been doing. And most of all, they had heard some of the things he had been saying. And they came to the conclusion he has had an emotional breakdown. He's had a nervous breakdown. He has lost his ability to think. He's lost his mind. Now, these were his friends and they said, he is deranged. He's lost his mind. If I were to ask you how many of you think he's deranged, nobody would raise your hand. But, but before you make that decision, you, better, you might ought to consider some of the things Jesus said. Jesus said, he came from another world. That's what he said. He said, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Jesus said, I have come from another world. Now suppose I'm at Food Lion buying groceries. And I'm standing over at the cookie section, one of my favorite sections. And I'm looking at Oreos and Chips Ahoy and all of those great uh, cookies there. And somebody comes up and he taps me on the shoulder. And I turn and I see this fella. And he says to me, sir, I want to tell you I have come from another world. Now what am I going to think about that guy? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to think about him. I think he's nuts. What do you mean you've come from another world? Man, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. That's what I'm going to think about him. But that's what Jesus said. He said, I have come from another world. Tell you something else Jesus said. Jesus said, I lived before I was ever born. He said that. He was talking to a group of men one day, and they said, we're Abraham's children. He said, no, you're not Abraham's children, because if you were Abraham's children, you'd love me, because when he saw me, he loved me. And they said, well, my soul, you're not even, you're not even uh, 50 years old. And they were right. He, he wasn't even 35 years old. And Abraham had been dead over 1,500 years 
How can a man who is less than 35 years old have been seen and loved by a man who'd already been dead over 1,500 years? But that's exactly what Jesus said. Now suppose I'm in Food Lion and I've moved over to the bakery section and I'm looking at cakes and pies and and, and bear claws and donuts and all of a sudden somebody comes up and he taps me on the shoulder and I turn and look at this guy and he said, Sir, I want to tell you I lived before I was ever born. Now, what am I going to think about that guy? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to think about him. I'm going to think he's nuts. He's lost his mind. He's off his off marble. He's crazy. Live before you were born. Get out. But that's exactly what Jesus said. I'll tell you something else Jesus said. Jesus said, when you look at me, you are looking into the face of God. That's what he said. He said, he that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. Now suppose I'm standing in food line, and I've moved over to the deli section, and I'm looking at cheese, and ham salad, and turkey salad, and chicken salad, and tuna salad, and oh my soul, I love the deli section. And somebody comes and taps me on the shoulder and says, Sir, when you look into my face, you're looking into the face of God. Now, what am I supposed to think about that guy? I tell you what, I'm going to think about him. I think he's nuts. He's crazy. What are you looking in the face? You're crazy. You're out of your mind. Hey, but that is exactly what Jesus said. I'll tell you something else Jesus said. Jesus said, I have all power in heaven and on earth, all of it. That's what he said. Now suppose I'm standing in food line and I have moved over to my favorite section next to cookies, the ice cream section. And I'm looking at vanilla and butter pecan and strawberry and some guy comes up and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, Sir, I have all power in heaven and earth. What am I going to think about that guy? i tell you what I'm going to think about him. I think he's nuts. Nuts. But that's exactly what Jesus said. Tell you something else Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the only way to heaven. I'm the only way to heaven. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. He said, I'm the only way to heaven. I suppose I'm standing in food line. And somebody comes up and he taps me on the shoulder. And he says, sir, I want to tell you. I'm the only way you can get to heaven. Now, what am I going to think? i tell you what I'm going to think. I'm going to think every nut in the world shops at Food Line. I'm going to Kroger's. <laughs> but hey, that's exactly what Jesus said. I'm the only way to heaven. I have all power in heaven and earth. When you look at my face, you're looking into the face of God. I lived before I was ever born. I have come from another world. And so when his friends heard some of those bizarre things that he'd been saying, they came to the conclusion he's had a breakdown. The pressure has gotten to him he no longer has the power to reason. And they came to seize him, to, to grab him and forcibly take him out of that house because they were his friends. And so, who is Jesus? Well, there are some who think he is deranged. But I want you to look at the very next verse. Look there in verse 22. 
and the scribes which came down from Jerusalem. Hey, hey, hey. These were not his friends, not this bunch. These were his enemies. The scribes from Jerusalem. Now, hey, there were scribes everywhere. But the scribes from Jerusalem, they were the big boys. I mean, all the other scribes wish they were scribes from Jerusalem because when these scribes from Jerusalem showed up, it was as though some royalty had stepped into the house. Oh, they had their turbans on their head and they had their robes and all that stuff dangling at the end of their robes and these men thought they were somebody. They thought they knew more about God. They thought they knew more about the Bible. They thought they knew more about anything than anybody else and they did everything they could do to discredit Jesus Christ. They wanted to put him out. They wanted to put him away and they come. So these are not his friends. These are his enemies. And look what they say. When the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub and by the prince of devils casteth he out devils. They said, Oh no, he's not deranged. He is demonic. You remember last night I told you that when the devil was cast out of heaven to the earth and one of the names he's called is Beelzebub and that means the prince of demons, the prince of devils. There it is right there. And so these these religionists, these scribes, these enemies of Jesus, they had a problem. Now they really did have a problem. They could not deny that Jesus was performing miracles. They couldn't. Because people were there. Jesus didn't do what he did in a corner. He didn't do what he did in secrecy. I mean, when he walked on water, people could see him. When he raised people from the dead, people could see him. When he made blind eyes to see and deaf people to hear and crippled people to walk, people were there. They saw him. They saw him tell the wind to stop blowing and it stopped blowing. They saw him tell the wind, the the, the sea to settle down and it became like glass. So everybody had seen the miracles that Jesus was doing. And so these scribes, they could not deny his miracles. Oh, no, that's all fake. That's all just to show. It's all pretend. Nobody would have believed them. They would have laughed them out of the house. So they couldn't deny the miracles. And so instead they said, oh, he's doing miracles all right. He's causing the wind to stop blowing and the sea to stop billowing and he's making this dead to live and the sick to be healed. He does all of that, but he's not doing it under the power of God. He's doing it under the power of Satan. He is full of demons. He's filled with the devil. That's what they said. And so there are some who believe Jesus is demonic. Now, when Jesus heard that, he called those scribes over to himself and he said, fellas, I want to ask you something. He said, if I'm full of the devil, if I'm doing what I'm doing under the power of the devil, then how can the devil continue to stand? Because I am reversing everything the devil is trying to do. He said, I haven't come to take sides with the devil. I have come to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus said, how can a kingdom that is divided stand? And how can a home that is divided stand? And how can the devil, if he's divided, stand? He said, fellas, I know what's wrong with you. You're nuts. They've been shopping at Food Line too long. (laughs) You're nuts. But there are some people who think that's the only way you can explain who Jesus is. He had power, but it was demonic power. And so I ask you, do you believe Jesus was deranged? Or do you believe Jesus was demonic? Well, there's only one other position to take. Look there with me, if you will, in verse 27. Jesus said, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods. 
except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Now in this little one verse parable, Jesus is talking about Satan. The strong man in verse 27 is the devil. And so Jesus said, how can somebody enter into a, the strong man's house and bind him and take things away from him? Who can do that? Who can enter into the strong man's house and bind him? I tell you who can, the stronger man. Years ago, I was pastor at the First Baptist Church in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. My wife and I were there for 11 years. We live back there now. But uh, we were there for 11 years. I was the pastor there. And one of the things we did there is for every summer, for about my last five or six summers there, we rented the football stadium and we had a starlight crusade. And we brought in famous personalities to come and, and to share a testimony. And then we had some wonderful music. And then I would preach and give an invitation like a, in sort of a small scale Billy Graham crusade. And so we would invite stars to come. We had Metal Ark Lemon from the Harlem Grove Globetrotters. We had Kim Fields, who was the little African-American girl on the, the Facts of Life back in those days. And, and we had uh, Dale Evans, Roy Rogers' wife. She came and shared her test. We had some really big-name folks. And one of the men we had, we had, the people loved him so much, we had him twice. The only one we had twice was Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower, the mouth of the South. Jerry Clower from Yazoo, Mississippi. And he would, you know, you know how he was. He'd wear that red suit and he'd get up and he'd tell all that old silly stuff about Mardell, Ludell, Overdale, and Underdale, and all the rest of the Dales. And when he got through telling all those stories, then he would share his testimony. And boy, it was really, really good. I tell you, Jerry Clower really loved the Lord. And he, I'll never forget one thing he said. He said, Folks, I want to tell you, the devil is mighty. But Jesus is almighty. The devil is a strong man. But Jesus is the stronger man. And Jesus left heaven. He stepped out of heaven and came to the earth. And he went into the house of the strong man. He went into the house of the devil and he bound him. And he began to spoil his house. He began to take things out of his house. And you're some of them and I'm one of them. Do you know why I'm here preaching today instead of on my way to hell? Because Jesus entered the strong man's house, bound him, and pulled me out of his house and made me a child of the living God. That means he is divine. He is God. You see, that's the heart of the Christian faith. That's why we send missionaries as Southern Baptists all over the world because we know the Bible teaches that Jesus is God. Buddha is not God. Muhammad is not God. Confucius is not God. Jesus Christ is God. He is God in the flesh. He is God of very God. He's God. And that's why we send missionaries, many of them serving in places that are so dangerous they cannot even identify themselves as missionaries. They call themselves teachers or, or other th things or helping people learn a trade. But they're really there sharing the gospel because they're convinced, we're convinced, I hope you're convinced that Jesus is divine. Now, you may come up with an alternative, but I don't know of any other three. It, it, beside those three, I can't come up with another. When you think about who Jesus is, what he did, where he went, what he said, and all the things he accomplished, either he was deranged or he was demonic or he was divine. So you have to come to grips now with that question. Who is Jesus? I've given you the only three options. You have to pick one of those three. Now we come to the second question. What are you going to do with him? Well, you see, what you're going to do with him is based upon who you've decided he is. Hey, if he's deranged, ignore him. 
just ignore it. I lived in Memphis for 20 years, and a lot of people in Memphis shop at Food Line. I'm just saying. I was in my car at a red light one day, and I looked over, and there was a fella. And I mean, he was cussing and ranting and raving and screaming. And I looked around to see who he was cussing at and ranting at, but it was, it was the light pole. I mean, he was having a fierce, violent argument with a post. I didn't feel impressed to get out and help him. <laughs> I ignored him. Hey, if you've come to the conclusion Jesus is deranged, well, just ignore him. Don't pay attention. If you've come to the conclusion he's demonic, then you need to avoid him. Stay as far away from him as you can. Have nothing to do with him. I mean, if you think Jesus is full of the devil, run from him. Avoid him. Let him alone. Have nothing to do with him. But if you think Jesus is divine, then you should receive him into your life. You should welcome him into your heart and trust him as your savior so who is Jesus well, he's deranged ignore him he's demonic avoid him he must be divine and he is receive him 